uh, let's try. I'll try to keep this talk short and um, try to cover the um, pipelines we use to generate these virtual brain models, individual virtual brain models. And yeah, this is mainly related to the question you had in this morning, whether you can use um, different templates for TVB, like different parcellations, different connectomes. Um, and the answer was yes. And now we'll cover some uh, more, go more into detail. Mm, maybe some of you have uh, some background in neuroimaging. So some of the steps we are doing will, won't be new to you. Uh, I'm basically showing uh, what, what steps are necessary to create a connectome, um, the structural connectome, a functional connectome, uh, and maybe even a little bit more. Um, and then I'll also show some solution, some um, like plug and play solutions if you have your own data and you want to generate a data in TBB format to play, uh, play with it. Okay, so I have to press the button here. Yeah. So what do we actually want to do? We want to create a um, brain network model from structural data, right? So we scan our patient or subject, object of interest in the MRI scanner, and we get structural data, T1, T2 weighted. Uh, we get diffusion weighted images to construct these tra tractograms in the end. Um, we, we use different kind of modalities to construct a parcellation of the cortex and also the subcortical structures. And in the end, what we do is we group these um, tracks, the, uh, the, the fibers in our tractogram, we group them together to create an abstract representation of the brain, right? So we, we want to end up with uh, this um, graph. Uh, where each node indicates a brain region and the edges between them are the connection strengths, or the, the connections in, uh, itself. So there's a whole bunch of software out there, different um, pipelines, people try to automate everything and um, depending on what kind of data, what kind of data quality you have, um, you can use different tools and different methods to correct for artifacts and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I cannot cover everything here. Um, I'm just showing you a bunch of different things that we are using and um, we, we also would like to recommend. So from these different pipelines out there, I want to mention three. Uh, one is the minimal preprocessing pipeline of the Human Con Connectome project, which we consider as our gold standard. Um, they have um, let's say very, very high quality data acquired in their scanners um, and also very, very good uh, pipelines adjusted specifically to these high quality data. Yeah? So this is what I mean is uh, the availability of, of your own data. Not, you don't have always the resources um, to scan and to use the same scanning parameters or maybe you have data acquired years ago but or you, you still think are important, then um, sometimes it's hard to adjust an existing pipeline to the data you actually have. Um, okay, um, so two other pipelines uh, are the one from Schöner and mm -hmm. our lab. TVB empirical data pipeline and the other one from our colleagues in Marseille, Timothée Poix. Um, also basically pipelines to construct um, brain networks model and uh, they already give you the output in TVB format which you can actually uh, ready to use then uh, in your simulations. So all these scripts, basically they, these are either Python or Bash scripts, they are available always via GitHub. Um, sometimes there's also a container of all of M3, there's a container, a Docker image, which you can like Docker pull and then execute on your own computer, on your own supercomputer. Um, especially the TVB empirical data pipeline is also installed on the neuroscience gateway and also on human brain project collaboratory. I'll show in, I'll show in the end how to get there. But if you have access um, by now, then you can log in and also get the links and there's tutorial videos and Jupyter notebooks which explain um, how to use this pipeline. So. Oh, I have to press this button. Yeah. So the overview of, of the pipeline here taken a scheme from Shona uh, is basically we have some kind of data in the beginning yeah, and um, we want to clean it from artifacts, a lot of um, distortions, um, uh, artifacts in your time series which you don't want to include um, because they might mess up your analysis in the end. So one big point is artifact removal. Another big point is to generate uh, accurate um, cortical and subcortical parcellation. Yeah, so you want a parcellation of your brain which, where regions really correspond to functional units um, represented here. And in the, end, in the end you want to 
uh, extract your connectome. Yeah? So you have maybe this is the tractogram from your diffusion weighted imaging and then you lay uh, the cortical parcellation on top of it and this is what you get. This is your structural connectivity either represented here in 3D as a graph or as an adjacency matrix. Yeah. You can also get a functional connectivity which um, in this case for example here is uh, just uh, pairwise correlations of region time series um, and also if you're interested in EEG, MEG or SEEG then there are several methods to compute lead field matrices which gives you the mapping of any dipole in for example the cortical surface, um, how is this is mapped onto the sensors on the brain, uh, on the head scalp. Yeah is then here, but really, really necessary, like the, the fundamental uh, to, for TQB to work is a structural connectivity. Uh, um, this is always uh, then used to compare your simulated data to empirical data, but this is really fundamental. So um, that's why I briefly will cover some artifact removal um, stuff, some um, aspects of to get a parcellation, to get a connectome, and in the end I'll show you the, the pipeline from the HVP collaboratory. Uh, yeah. So artifact cleaning, um, sure you probably uh, all know a lot of them. Um, there's spatial distortions, there's uh, inhomogeneity artifacts, um, and uh, right, so I, I introduced these three pipelines. I wanna, what I want to mention here is always that there will be a short table in the left or right lower corner um, naming the pipeline and then having a red cross if it's not available, this particular step in the pipeline, or having a, a green tick of if this step is done. And here I have two dots for the HTTP line, pipeline because um, they really take care of uh, a lot of these uh, artifacts in a really good way, but again, this is dependent on the data quality they have. So, yeah, gradient non-linearity distortions are basically uh, caused that the um, magnetic field doesn't decay linearly. Um, that's a huge problem in these HCP, they're special scanners, so they have to really take care of this. And other Siemens, like the, the usual three Tesla Siemens scanners, um, no, this shouldn't be a huge issue, um, but it can be corrected for. Another big issue is this um, B1 bias field, and so this is the uh, applied magnetic field, which causes these inhomogeneity um, drifts. Yeah? So actually, white matter should always have the same um, in, uh, intensity wherever you are in the brain. Yeah? So white matter down here should be as white as up there. Yeah? But as you can see, there's a huge shift. It is like a shadow up here, which um, uh, obscures or makes all the voxels up there lower in intensity. And you can actually, there are different uh, statistical methods to compute these inhomogeneity fields, um, like here, and then you can rec for this and get a huge image, a nice image with um, correct yeah, intensities in all the voxels. This is basically important for segmentation. So uh, if you apply then a segmentation algorithm, which tries to classify each voxel into, let's say, gray matter, white matter, um, cortical uh, spinal fluid, and then these uh, intensities are very, very important. Otherwise, these algorithms may fail. Okay, so B1 by field correction. The next step are, for example, in very important in fMRI and diffusion-weighted imaging are the spatial distortions. Uh, caused by the interaction of the static magnetic field with the properties of the tissue. Um, um, very pronounced in frontal regions and also uh, temporal regions. Um, so the, the tissue itself interacts with the magnetic field and causes these spatial distortions which lead to uh, like these uh, stretches um, or um, compressing in, in, in different areas. Um, but you can estimate uh, these distortions uh, within the field map and then like un unstretch or uncompress the um, fMRI image. Also very important in diffusion weighted imaging. What another uh, technique uh, instead of the field maps uh, to correct for this is you can apply, uh, you can scan the whole sequence. Um, yeah, you, you can, the best way is to uh, scan the whole sequence twice. One with uh, posterior anterior face encoding and so one parameter of your fMRI and diffusion weighted imaging and the other one is uh, anterior posterior face encoding and what is the, the result of this is basically once you have stretching in, uh, and compressing in one direction as you can see here yeah, the frontal lobe is like stretched to the front and here it's actually compressed and out of these two images you can estimate um, these distortions and finally you get a corrected image over here on the right. 
Yeah, but again, this uh, requires more resources to scan um, different images or with different parameters all the time. So another step in artifact cleaning, also very important in diffusion weighted and fMRI images is motion realignment. Yeah? So if you scan like resting state or even task an fMRI for a couple of minutes, subjects um, might move uh, during the task. This for example plotted here. Yeah? So guess how many task blocks there were in this design. Yeah? So each uh, like sharp peak over here is uh, the reset or the, like the, the resting block. So uh, in each resting block the subject like fell back with his head or relaxed and you suddenly see these spikes. Yeah? So you have like rotations uh, in all directions and also translations of your head. Uh, that's why there's six uh, time series. So you correct for them like you, yes? So you mentioned the table with the different pipelines that they care of all of these artifacts, right? Um, it doesn't show up in the next slides. Right, right. Uh, so uh, in those uh, pipelines which have uh, fMRI processing, yes. So the, uh, the HCP pipeline does it, the Schirner pipeline does it, the Timothy Poir pipeline, the, the TBB record, the third one, actually doesn't process uh, resting state fMRI. It's main, more concerned on the, um, mm, on the structural preprocessing. Yeah. So, but that is usually, that those are basic steps on um, fMRI preprocessing. So you realign this image and sometimes this is not enough to account for all the artifacts in your time series. So you um, use motion regression, basically you use a linear model or uh, approximation thereof to use the, these regressors uh, to filter out the effects of the movement, movement in your fMRI time series. And Another other fact is the eddy currents, ba basically due to this fast switching of the magnetic fields, you can induce electric currents um, and they themselves also cause distortions here and there is like FSL has a nice toolbox to correct for these uh, distortions. Um, yeah, right here is back the, you know, the table and the HCP does it. Um, these other two pipelines don't do it yet. What I'm talking about here is ICA uh, denoising. Uh, so your fMRI signal, you can think of being um, composed of several sources. So there are several sources contributing to your neural signal, your, your fMRI signal. You know, there are neural sources, which are good, which are really the ones you want to measure. And there are not neural sources, which are basically artifacts, which you want to remove. And these artifacts could be signal originating from white matter, from uh, motion, cardiac, respiratory uh, pulsations in your cerebral spinal fluid, in your um, sinuses. Yeah, so there are different kind of uh, sources you also measure with your fMRI and ICA de um, tries to uh, use a statistical technique to decompose your measured signal into all these separate sources yeah? and in the end you get um, a spatial as well as a temporal pattern for each source and then you can decide okay judging by the spatial distribution and by this temporal pattern I declare this is neural source, you know, this is some um, signal arising from neural activity in a gray matter, or um, this is not neural, yeah, it's basically an artifact and I want to have this removed. And if this works perfectly, it, it in the end removes all the artifact component and you remain with the neural signal. Um, so here are some examples, yeah, so sometimes, for example, you might find a spatial pattern here uh, within the white matter and this is not what we want, we want activity in gray matter. Those are motion artifacts. Um, this is cardiac artifacts here in the in the um, in the ventricles. Okay, so we we said we had um, spatial patterns, but we also have temporal patterns. So very like very fast oscillating um, rhythms are not really what we would expect in neural tissue and. Um, like these smooth, uh, slow oscillations are uh, what we want. So this is the time series here and this is the spectrogram. And based on different uh, features like spatial and mm, temporal features, um, you then classify your components into good or bad and you remove the bad ones and remain with the good ones. And there is um, actually an ICA fix is a classifier to do this for you. So it's a machine learning technique which uh, is trained on a, on a sample data set. So let's say you have a study of 50 subjects. You classify the first, um, let's say 20 subjects by hand. So you do the ICA on each fMRI of the subject and then you classify the 100 components into good or bad. 
Yeah? Um, and then you give these classifications to ICA Fix, and he learns from your sample what's good, what's bad, and does the, the other 30 subjects for you. Yeah, there are also pre-trained classifiers um, for the HCP data set, for other data sets. Um, but I would recommend, or we, we would recommend to train your own. It's, it's worth, the, worth the effort. Okay, so next thing is then parcellations. Mm, what is the goal here? Actually, we want to um, identify regions with the same functionality in the brain. Yeah? So we want to classify a piece of the cortical sheet or the, the sub, on the subcortical gray matter to be um, one functional unit, you know, which we want to model later on. And there's several ways to do this. Um, back or um, like the, the, the standard methods some years ago was to uh, define an atlas on some standard space like M and I, you know, where you draw these lines between different regions, and then you would use um, nonlinear warping or nonlinear registration to warp your subject. A brain onto this atlas and then there you have your postulation on the subject brain as well. Uh, however, there are several drawbacks to this. Um, Nonlinear registration in three dimensions is pretty hard uh, and the anatomy is not always uh, aligning well with the function. Yeah, and um, also smoothing, for example, in three dim in, in, in the volume um, doesn't take a into account the uh, the true distance or the, like the functional distance between brain areas, because actually the the cortical uh, the, the cortical you know, it's a cortical sheet, right? It's a two-dimensional sheet rather than really a three-dimensional object, and this is why, for example, the human connectome project does most of their processing on on, on these cortical sheets. And for example, here, like in three dimension, the distance or the Euclidean distance here between area one, uh, area A, and area B is very short. Uh, rather than on a cortical surface, this would be a rather long distance. Although, if you represent your cortex in a sheet, you know you have these advantage to um, un yeah, unravel the, the true distance between areas. Mm. Okay, it's, yeah, it's easier than spatial relationships are reserved. And what are the, the file format for this is actually not um, more uh, nifty, um, which is like a volume representation of the brain, nor neither gifty, which is just a surface representation, but it's the combination of both. Yeah? It's called sifty, and the um, elements in there are called gray ordinates. So you have a, a surface representation and a volumetric representation of the brain in one file. Um, the cortical sheet, left and right hemisphere, are represented by around 30k or 30,000 vertices, and then there's another 30,000 uh, gray ordinates or voxels for the subcortical areas. Mm, and this is done. Uh, this is used by the Human Connectome Project pipeline. Yeah? So they do all their um, registration uh, or the, their parcellation uh, on it, and also uh, fMRI processing. Yeah, and here are maybe some examples, the, the reason why um, one should take into account not only one, um, uh, one feature of the subject for postulation, but several. For example, if we do nonlinear registration, yeah, we have these uh, voxel intensities which get aligned and um, the, the folding. Uh, FreeSurfer, for example, does um, parcellation according to anatomical landmarks defined by the cortical folding as well. But, however, cortical folding can be very complex and uh, varies across subjects. Here, for example, twin, twin brains, yeah, and even there, there's a huge um, difference in their cortical folding. Um, here, uh, for example, microscopic studies or ana anatomy studies showing the um, uh, extension of the one area, 17 and area 18, um, here in the, in, the, in the brain for four different subjects. And as you can see, already the, the functional units don't re align very well with cortical folding. So this is why um, the Human Connectome Project decided to follow a different approach where they use uh, not only one feature, but uh, or they use multimodality to classify regions in the brain. So what do they use? They use myelin map, you know, the, the myelin content in the cortical sheet, which is calculated from T2 and T1 images. They use task as fMRI activation patterns, uh, functional, connecti uh, functional connectivity, and um, well, in the, in the first basic principle step, they also use uh, cortical folding for the first uh, smooth alignment. And then they co basically compute the gradients 
um, the like the spatial gradients uh, of these maps, and they um, draw then. They, uh, okay, they draw then. They define areas where these gradients are very sharp, meaning there's a sudden transition from one to another area. And here, for example, is the cortical, the motor strip. Um, these are basically the four uh, the, 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 um, different modalities you can find. This is the cortical folding, and these are the names for the different areas. And uh, what you basically see is that for different areas, you really have um, different values for diff in the different features. Have, for example, cortical thickness is low in all of the four areas. Myelin is really differentiating here. And uh, yeah, cortical folding as well is uh, higher or lower in different areas. And this is then the classification, right? In the end, the four areas are separated by the different modalities. And if you do this for the whole brain, <coughs> you come up with this cortical parcellation into 180 areas for each hemisphere. So 180 plus 180 plus um, 19 subcortical areas makes up 379 um, regions in the brain. Mm. Yeah, here color coded by their responding uh, respondents to different task fMRIs. Cool. So, um, right, I said in the beginning this is a necessary step. I also uh, we said uh, we talked about functional MRI um, that this is basically used to compare then your simulated activity to something. You know, you have some empirical data to compare to validate your simulation to, uh, but you definitely need um, structural connectomes. And here is just basically uh, very short depicted how to do this um, or how this is done. So this is not part of the HCP um, minimal preprocessing pipeline. It's only taken care of in the other two. Uh, HCP does diffusion preprocessing, but um, they don't do tractography and um, connectome extraction in the end. So, but um, you can easily build up on their preprocessed data already. So what do we measure with diffusion imaging exactly? So we measure something like this yeah, signal. Uh, which can be, so we, we measure uh, the diffusion of water molecules, okay? And water molecules tend to diffuse along an axon more easily than um, through it. So if you measure diffusion in a brain from different areas and from different directions, uh, you get different diffusion values and um, high diffusion in one direction is then indicating, okay, axons might flow along this direction in this particular voxel. And sometimes you have uh, crossing fibers, so in one voxel there's not only an, an axon in one direction but another fiber which is crossed. And this is depicted here, so let's assume this is one uh, fiber with its signal and this is the other one, and if you uh, add them two together, this is what you measure. Now the, uh, the difficulty is now to derive some kind of um, uh, yeah, to, to untangle them in, basically in the end, and therefore you, we do use the spherical convolution, so we have some function um, of a signal uh, which we expect to be in those voxels where you have only have one fiber. Yeah? So there's really obvious, there's very um, directed. Um, this would be the function which we would attain if there's just one fiber in one voxel. However, this is our measured signal, so we use this function to deconvolve the signal into something like that. Okay? And this is then the probability of um, um, axons in this, or fibers in this one voxel. And here this is these um, ellipsoids we get. Uh, we get them in every region of the brain. And then we use integration. So ba basically what you saw before in the phase plane, indicated by these arrows, we also now step through the brain, starting at different positions, and the uh, direction of the steps are given by these functions we just measured in the fusion-weighted imaging. Okay, and what we end up with is the tractogram, these um, trees of different fibers. And as I said, we in the end uh, use the parcellation to put this on top and generate the um, three uh, the, the structural connectivity we are interested in. Um, Okay, so maybe this is uh, then really quick. Um, of course, this, uh, this model we are using now, yeah, we, we don't really measure any single fibers. This is always a model we, uh, we are trying to track these fibers with. Um, has some limitations and we, we try to improve them. So this stepping through the brain um, happens uh, probabilistic. So in each voxel we like throw a dice according to um, 
according to this um, probability function, we move in a different direction in each voxel. And uh, it could happen that we end up in very different areas in the brain. You know? And some of the areas we end up with our track are implausible. For example, we could track fibers which end up in a ventricle you know, or um, which go outside of the brain. And uh, this is then captured with this technique uh, called anatomical constraint tractography. So basically, during tracking, we uh, give the, the algorithm information on where, which are the plausible tracks to keep and the other ones to discard. So, for example, if you enter gray matter, yeah, um, don't exit it. Once you enter it, keep the track, it's good, it's plausible, but uh, don't continue it outside of the gray matter. Yeah, this is implausible. Or um, so, so these are, yeah, for example, here to track the cortical column, yeah, the cortical, the spinal column, then um, keep this track as well if it leaves this area down here. Uh, and it's a for on some force, there are different um, rules to keep with. Uh, Another drawback also from this model is that it doesn't take into account volumes. So each uh, track we are generating is basically assumed to have zero volume. However, this is not really the case in the brain, right? E e e any, every axon, even it's, if it's very thin, has some volume and there's only so much space in the brain, so they have to share this volume with each other. And um, here's like this filtering then applied afterwards. Consider this is the signal we are measuring with our scanner. And then we construct a tractogram from this. You know, this is the from here to here, through stepping through the brain. And it's everything is green. It's overlaid with all uh, the different um, tracks we just recreated. And if we would now imagine uh, on this brain, we would now perform a diffusion weighted imaging again. We end up with this. And as you can see, the um, fiber density in each voxel is a lot higher than before. You know? This is actually the, the signal that we measured in the real brain, and this would be the signal we measure in this model brain. So something went wrong with the tractography. Yeah, some some uh, some uh, axons are overrepresented, others um, underrepresented, and therefore we use different techniques like ZIFT and ZIFT2 to filter uh, this tractogram and keep only the plausible tracks um, to make the structural connectivity more realistic in the end. Okay, so the, the last step really, mm, before I show the pipeline on HPP, is um, also forward modeling. If you're interested in MEG or EEG, uh, there's different toolboxes out there. Mm, ones mentioned here are Brainstorm and MNE, which use uh, different modeling techniques, for instance, boundary element models in OpenMEG, but there are different, different other ones as well. Mm, so basically what they model is, um, a dipole on the cortical sheet and how this uh, creates an electromagnetic field and then can be measured through electrodes on the scalp. So it creates a model uh, for uh, your EEG and this is what we use in TVB. So for example, this is our cortical surface and you see around the scalp of this person and these dots here are the locations of the EEG sensors and your software, whichever you use, or your, your model then predicts the impact each of these small dots here has on each of this, uh, on, on the sensors. And this gives us, in the end, the lead field matrix. Um, it can be done for EEG, as depicted here, but also MEG, or um, like electrodes stuck into the brain, as you saw in the epilepsy case in the beginning. Um, and right, and this is um, taken care of in this pipeline here. Uh, it's automated. Mm, with some problems, actually, you have to define the, the, the so you have, you have an individual cortical surface and also individual locations of your sensors, but you have to define some fiducial points like left and right uh, preauricular points and also nauseam and uh, to yeah, to get accurate um, locations of your sensors. Right. So last step. Ah, okay. This is a summary. <laughs> Uh, of what we just saw before. Um, so we recommend using HCP pipeline with the uh, limitations that uh, you have this high quality data or you might have to adjust the pipeline to onto your needs. It's very good in artifact correction, the way FMI does surface-based analysis. 
but it doesn't do uh, EEG modeling or forward solutions and also no connectome extraction, but you could add this in the end with your own um, preferred software and pipelines. Um, TBB and Pimple Data and TBB Recon also available with Docker and install different services here. Uh, with the drawback that TBB Recon doesn't do fMRI, but uh, it does the connectome extraction and also TBB does, a TBB empirical data pipeline does EEG modeling in the end. Yes, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about fMRI threat. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so they also provide a Docker image which uh, we yeah, we're thinking about combining it maybe with TBB and Pregal data pipelines, so to like merge different pipelines into one and then in the end um, build on, on top of this to create input for TBB. Um, yeah. But I mean, uh, TBB and FMI prep is basically also yeah, a Python, Python package to, which interacts with all the tools. It looks like uh, HCP, but more flexible. You have your own data, mm -hmm. which creates uh, some uh, pipelines that mm. yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's good. One always, um, I think, has to take into account how, also how much you want to automate all of this. Um, I'll, I'll show now in the next slide that here this pipeline you can basically just with two commands you, you pull the Docker image and then you give it the input and it spits you out the connect home and the TVB um, data formats. Um, uh, but Obviously, it, if you if you want uh, uh, better to adjust it to some uh, to your own data, you need to provide it with some more flexibility. And this is the uh, um, like, yeah, what's it called? Not drawback, but trade off. There's a trade off between like flexibility and optimization. Um, in this case. Uh, yeah, yeah, so Glo um, they do um, fMRI cleaning with ICA fix. They are not taking into account things like white matter regression or global signal regression. Um, I mean, yeah, global signal, I didn't cover it here, but I mean, global signal regression also have these known drawbacks with uh, introducing maybe uh, spurious negative correlations. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's debatable, I, uh, and I cannot cover <laughs> all of this here, and um, yeah. Yeah, it's just one solution. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Yeah. There are multi, many, many different ways to tackle the problem. Yeah. Okay, so you have your login to HPP Collaboratory, and once you're logged in, uh, you can press this button up here, platform, and go to neuroinformatics. And then not this page should appear, but you should at least see this menu on the left. And then click on t list of tools. And then several tools should be, pop up, should be popping up here. And also toolbar where you then can search for the model construction pipeline. And this site should show up. <coughs> where is the introduction and also on how to use this pipeline. Mm, there is a links to a quick video tutorial on how to start this pipeline on your supercomputer. There's an example collaboratory, like an example in a Jupyter notebook, which shows you on how to actually start this um, pipeline from within HPP collaboratory, if you have access to one of their supercomputers. If you don't, then you can't, but <laughs> it gives you introduction on how to do this, it gives you instructions. And also this you will find there, and as I said, it's uh, mm, made very, very, uh, it can run very autonomous. It doesn't require much. Uh, you have to download the software with this command, docker pull from this repository, and then you can either run this on your uh, supercomputer. Here, this job scheduler is, uh, was slurm, I think, yeah, which is this command, s run here, submits a job. And on many supercomputers, it's not Docker installed, but it's Shifter, which works with Docker images without uh, issues. And to run it on your uh, computer, on your local machine, you can type in this command and give it 
uh, input in, as a bits data format. Yeah? So you need um, T1, T2 and you need diffusion weighted images. Um, yeah, and this is then it will print out, uh, give you the results in TVB format and give you the structural connectome and the cortical surface, the um, EEG forward solution, which can then all be, um, for example, used in a graphical user interface. Uh, ah, yeah, this is the notebook um, and also a link to the video tutorial. Okay, so this was the talk, basic talk about the pipelines.